Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center. You're all on time. Uh, it's impressive because the weather outside is beautiful. Um, some of you have been on our road show for about the last day. And uh, I apologize to those people for repeating some things, but it is uh, lovely to welcome new faces um, and new brain cells to the Wilson Center uh, for this important afternoon um, event. I'm Jane Harmon. I'm the chairman and CEO. No, I'm not. The chairman is here. Tom Nides, or was here. <laughs> I'm the president and CEO of the uh, Wilson Center and a recovering politician. That, that probably explains my brain lapse. Um, uh, but the Wilson Center, as I think many of you know, has invested in Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union for 40 years. Ambassador George Kennan and others founded the Kennan Institute in 1974. It's our oldest program. We have 1,400 scholar alumni worldwide uh, uh, from our Kennan Institute, and 100 of them are on the ground right now in Ukraine. That's why in the past month alone, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, OSCE Secretary General Lamberto Zanier, uh, and foreign, uh, Russian foreign minister, former Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev have all spoken here. And so has former German ambassador Wolfgang Issinger twice, uh, the mo most recently about 15 minutes ago, at a lunch where there was the Jane and Wolfgang show, but basically talking about his recent service in Ukraine as the convener of the um, OSCE roundtables, which uh, everyone believes played an important role in helping the country come together for historic elections. I was an election observer there with one of our panelists uh, just uh, 10 days ago. Today's topic, if it's not the Cold War, what is it? A topic, I'm sure, designed by uh, Aaron David Miller sitting in the front row. He doesn't know what this, uh, anything about the subject, but he's really good at writing titles. Uh, cannot come at a more important time. Uh, I'm not a name caller, but certainly some have named Vladimir Putin uh, a Russian ayatollah, a delusional, messianic, narcissistic, moralistic, brutal, or all of the above. Um, but surely he's not, this I would agree with, not the cool, rational intellectual that defines Barack, Barack Obama. And that makes for a mutually difficult relationship which is playing out in Ukraine, Syria, Iran, uh, missile defense, and trade challenges, among other things. Uh, changing either man is highly unlikely, but changing Russian policy is doable if the U.S. is careful and adroit. Uh, three mega talents, four, are here to help us understand the landscape. Uh, Tom Pickering, uh, everyone knows, is former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, former Deputy Secretary of State. Were you with that? No, he wasn't that. I just promoted him. That was Tom Nides. Former U.S. Ambassador to Russia and uh, at least one country on every continent. I think I got that right. And a dear friend of mine and of the Wilson Center. Matt Rajansky, I just mentioned, uh, accompanied Jane Harmon to Ukraine a week ago. He's director of our Kennan Institute, uh, a fluent Russian speaker, uh, knows absolutely everybody uh, there and in, the, in Russia and, and parts around. Fiona Hill is director of Brookings Center on the U.S. and Europe, a former national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council, and has published uh, a book uh, which gets raves on Vladimir Putin. And then, of course, there is NPR's Michelle Kellerman, herself a former NPR uh, Moscow bureau chief. Uh, and uh, she now covers the State Department and Washington's uh, diplomatic corps, her reports can be heard on all NPR news programs, and I personally listen to all NPR news programs, <laughs> including Morning Edition and All Things Considered. Uh, on her latest beat, uh, she has accompanied all the recent secretaries of state around the world, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, um, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell. She was part of the NPR team that won the 2007 Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award for coverage of the war in Iraq. Um, as most of you know, NPR moderates the Wilson Center's National Conversation Series. And so we get to see up close and, po and, and personal all the brilliant talent there is at NPR. Uh, we are enormously honored uh, by this partnership. And as they say on TV, 
The show begins right now. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Um, really glad to be here, uh, and I'm counting on this group to come up with some other language other than, is this a new Cold War? Um, <laughs> we need some new catchphrases here. It's clear the post-Cold War era has ended, but, but what is this now? Can the U.S. and Russia um, really cooperate on things? Does Russia even want to? Uh, have we had the wrong assumptions about what Russia's wanted for the past um, 20 years. We've had, we've already introduced everybody, so, but I, so I want to turn first to um, Ambassador Pickering to, to kick this off. Uh, you know, he was ambassador, as we said, to, to Russia. It was much different times then, more hopeful times then. Um, but, but we've seen a lot of cycles of ups and downs in this relationship. Um, is this something new, or is this cyclical? This is time of troubles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little better than it sounds, and it could get a lot worse. My sense is that uh, for their own reasons, for historical reasons as well, both sides have in one way or another backed into several propellers on the way here and that there is time to pick up. And I think that uh, Ben Rhodes' admonition that there wouldn't be a one-on-one, -on -one, but there would be something, may be okay for domestic politics, but it's not okay for foreign affairs. And my sense is that we need contact and we need an ability to talk. I also sense that, like every difficulty, on the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side, it is imperative to listen to both sides of the talk, however miserable a lot of it is. That uh, our great potential as Saturday afternoon football players to pick winners and losers is not, in my view, the kind of guiding light we should be following now. My own sense is that if there is not yet a serious movement away on the Russian side from the present effort to stir up troubles in eastern Ukraine and perhaps beyond, then the pressure does need to go up. But I also think we need to be, be very careful and thoughtful about something that seemingly has disappeared from our profession of interest of diplomacy. What doors are out there that we would like to see Mr. Putin walk through? And can we shape those? And I think that's very hard. And that's increasingly a less persuasive argument than it was a month or a month and a half ago. But I'm not sure that it is totally divorced from reality if we seek a way through this. Uh, my own sense is that finding those doors is very hard. But there is one self-evident problem that should bring everybody together, whether they're ready to do that or not, and that is the horrendously difficult situation in which the Ukraine finds itself economically, to say nothing of politics. And whether this is a time when dealing with the economy can have a useful effect on political moves, or whether, in fact, it is a dead duck, I don't know. But I think it is worth looking at. I also think that the mantra has to be something along the following lines as we go at this, uh, that there is no possibility of Russian control over Ukraine. There is absolutely no possibility Ukraine could, in any way or in any imagination, be a threat to Russia. And there is certainly an absolute necessity for Ukraine to be a country of majority rule but full observance of minority rights. And that we have to get the weapons out of the picture as quickly and as, I think, as patiently and perhaps as adamantly as we can. Uh, to me, those are the kinds of courses of action that have to be out there. And I have no scenario or no game plan uh, but I am uh, uh, deeply concerned that if those elements or something like them are not kept in the picture, and if diplomacy is not part of the answer, then force will be. 
and I despair that force will have anything useful to say uh, about this time of troubles. Okay. Um, for opening comments from Fiona, I'd like to ask um, broadly about Putin, because you've been to all these conferences mm -hmm. over the years, the Valdai, you've, you've watched him, written this book. Um, you once posed the question to me that, um, you know, the, this administration, the U.S. is now going to have to think about how do we deal with a guy who's constantly looking back, who sees the end of the Soviet Union as the worst calamity of the, of the, of the last century. Um, how do you deal with someone always looking back if you want to look forward? So have you been thinking about that and what the U.S. could do? Yes, I've been thinking about this a lot since you and I had that uh, conversation because, of course, we were posing a lot of questions to each other at the time about, you know, how do we deal with this? And I think, you know, as um, you know, we've heard from uh, Tom Pickering here, it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to be easy for a whole host of uh, other reasons. I want to actually pick up on, uh, you know, how Jane Harmon uh, began um, at the very beginning of uh, the intro here. Um, Jane, you know, uh, made the assertion that uh, Putin is not the co cool, rational intellectual that uh, uh, President Obama is. I would actually say that Putin is actually a cool, rational pragmatist and professional dissembler. And that's the difference between going to the KGB Academy and Harvard Law School. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and I come from Harvard, so I can say this. All of you Yaleys and Princetonites out there might actually have a different uh, view of Harvard Law School. But anyway, nonetheless, you know, <laughs> there is a difference here. And if you wanted to think about a country that was being run by a KGB officer, a former KGB officer, who has a lot of views rooted in the past of that institution, then Russia Today is giving you a very good example of it. Um, you asked uh, also, have we had the wrong assumptions about Russia for the last 20 years? And I would say that we've actually had the wrong assumptions about Vladimir Putin and his attentions for quite a long time. And those come out of uh, the backdrop that um, Tom um, uh, dealt with when he was ambassador um, in Russia. Russia was trying to transform itself into something different, a new Russia. But yet, there's a great deal of continuity, as all the research here at uh, Kennan and the Woodrow Wilson Center shows, all the great scholars here have shown a lot of continuity rather than change in the overall political uh, culture in Russia. Putin is really ch channeling all of that, these deep uh, cultural trends in Russia, this deep history. It's all about his interpretation of the past, how he interprets the past. He's eventually saying that if he, he creates a great Russia, puts Russia back on the international stage, the future will take, take charge of itself. Now, that's not a very satisfying response uh, for most people. But Putin is also the master of deliberate ambiguity. Um, I um, actually made a quip on another uh, media uh, program that um, if we want to deal with uh, Mr. Putin, you know, there's all these great HBO shows and Netflix, and everybody's obsessed at the moment about you know, Homeland, although we're waiting for the next series, um, House of Cards and Game of Thrones. Well, I've actually come to think that Game of Thrones is extraordinarily useful if you kind of put aside all the gratuitous violence and all the other things that kind of go there for understanding the world of Mr. Putin. And for those of you who don't watch this, this is a bit of kind of a fantasy Britain, I actually sometimes think, back in the days, you know, before the unification of, of that, uh, that country. And Mr. Putin is, is, uh, has a character, actually, who's out there. And all of you can run off to uh, the wiki for uh, Game of Thrones shortly to look up uh, Peter Baelish also known as, uh, as Littlefinger, who had a great quote in one of the last episodes I watched, which is, if people don't know who, who you are and they don't know what you want, they don't know your next move. And that's exactly what Putin has set about to make it extremely confusing to figure out, as Jane said at the beginning, exactly what is he. And many of these ideas about Putin being irrational or delusional, these are actually seeded by Vladimir Putin. And you can actually trace uh, comments about him. There's, a, there's a, an idea going around right now that at uh, one point in the KGB Academy, Putin got a black mark for having a lowered sense of risk. The only source for that is from Vladimir Putin himself in interviews. And he variously tells people, if you look back all the way, you know, as one can do through the journalistic archives, including at NPR, that he sometimes said that was a black mark at university, sometimes it's the Red Banner Academy, and sometimes um, it's, uh, as his KGB works, it depends on who he's talking to and why he's telling the story. And that's the whole particular point. Putin is we we weaving narratives about himself. He is distorting history. And it's all about justifying whatever position that he comes up to. And that's what makes it extraordinarily difficult for us to deal with. Because we're dealing, in a way, in a fantasy realm uh, and in an artificial environment. And that's exactly playing to Putin's, you know, uh, basically mastery of uh, the gray zones. Uh, he is playing in an area where 
we have set down rules and uh, he is throwing all of those rules and all of those assumptions right off and he actually um, really benefits from un being underestimated and also being labelled in certain ways because what he's always going to do is to try to find out how he can outmaneuver us. So as we start to think, um, as Tom has very wisely said, about how we can um, really shape this, we're going to have to factor in that there's somebody who is going to deliberately not let give us any kind of sense of where he wants to go and what exactly he wants to, uh, to do. And he's always going to be wait to see how we react and what we put on the table. And then he's going to calibrate accordingly. So we'll talk a little bit more later about how we influence that. Uh with sanctions or different, different sets of options. And I want to turn to Matt Rojanski, just back from Ukraine. So let's uh, get focused back on that issue um, now. Um, I wonder, you know, um, uh, John Kerry met today with um, Lavrov. They meet all the time and somehow seem to talk past each other all the time. But today they both said that they don't want um, uh, Ukraine to be a pawn in this uh, east-west battle. But is Ukraine going to always be stuck in this buffer zone between the two? I mean, is, is that sort of, is there any way out of that? Well, you know, I, I started my career in a way as, a, as an analyst of this part of the world on Ukraine. Um, and I started it even more so uh, from one line in one very great book. Uh, it was the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, because he mentioned an amnesty which had been promulgated by Nikita Khrushchev before his secret speech denouncing Stalin, uh, almost a year before, actually, in which he released, uh, it turned out, I found out in my research, almost a quarter of a million uh, Ukrainians some of whom were nationalist activists, followers of Stepan Bandera, the, the nationalist leader that we had talked about, accused of being a Nazi collaborator, others just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And why he did this, uh, undoing Stalin's legacy uh, less than a decade after the end of the war, even before denouncing Stalin, was a fascinating question. And that's what brought me into the study of, of Russia and Ukraine first from, from history. But Solzhenitsyn continues to be enormously useful, and we, uh, through, through Drew Guff, one of our uh, long-standing supporters and friends of the Kennan Institute, we announced the Solzhenitsyn Project at our 40th anniversary gal about a month ago. And Drew read this quote from Solzhenitsyn, which you will, I hope, humor me in allowing me to read a few <laughs> lines from now because it, I think it's transformative. Solzhenitsyn in 1981 wrote in a letter to, uh, to a colleague in Canada, the Ukrainian question is one of the most dangerous questions facing us in the future. It can strike a bloody blow at us during the very moment of liberation. On both sides, we are mentally poorly prepared to face it. Just as it is useless to prove to Ukrainians that we all hail by blood and in spirit from Kiev, so too Russians do not want to appreciate that those living along the Dnieper are a different people and that many injuries and grievances were so sown by the Bolsheviks. It will be very difficult to guide this conversation to a sensible haven, but whatever voice and weight I have, I shall apply it to this end. In any case, I know one thing. Should there arise, God forbid, a Russo-Ukrainian war, I won't join it myself and I won't let my sons go. This is a man who I think by any measure is a Russian patriot, was a Russian patriot, uh, a nationalist, uh, certainly an enemy of communism and the Bolshevik system. And I think you can see in this his own understanding of Ukraine and Russia's relationship with Ukraine is extremely tortured. There is not a simple and clear answer. These are two countries that have been linked at the hip, that have been interlocked in their respective histories, and that will, for the foreseeable future, be neighbors no matter what the shape of that border is. I think the question was asked at lunch, what should it be? I'm not sure that there is a right answer to that question. The answer is it's going to be a border. It's going to be a shared border. And by the way, the class I teach on Ukraine has been titled by two different universities, <laughs> Borderland, over my objection. <laughs> but to be honest, there's some truth in it. Look, I think the situation in Ukraine cannot but be um, uh, a bit of a ball game, right? But does it have to be, uh, you know, tennis or ping pong? Or, or can it be something that has a little bit more strategy and a little bit more long term to it? I think that's the question. 
At the moment, there is an urgent, immediate challenge. Petro Poroshenko has just been elected the new president of Ukraine in what Jane and other observers, I think, rightly deem basically a free and fair election for basically most of the country, with some caveats. Um, but he faces, I think, a nearly impossible challenge. I call it the rock and the hard place uh, because there are, in fact, two distinct, competing, and almost mutually exclusive sets of pressures. The rock is Russian pressure in the east, pressure from separatists who may or may not now be under Mr. Putin's control. Once you let that genie out of the bottle, you have an awful lot of trouble putting it back in. We've learned that throughout the post-Soviet space and beyond. Um, and from the class of oligarch politicians uh, and the corrupt Ukrainian power elite who are now wondering, this isn't just Mr. Yanukovych personally and his son, Sasha the dentist, who somehow went from being <laughs> worth like $600,000 to $400 million in the course of three years. Uh, it's not just those guys. They're, they're, they're gone. They're out of the picture. Uh, but there are still literally dozens of people worth tens of millions and billions of dollars wondering where do we fit in in the future of Ukraine? What's going to happen to our property? Is there going to be a new wave of realignment of property ownership? also known as corporate <coughs> rating, like happened after the Orange Revolution, when the good guys won. But then all of a sudden, all of the good guys' best friends started to get very, very wealthy. So there are a lot of very scared people on one side of the equation who are going to extract concessions from Mr. Poroshenko in order to play as part of the Ukrainian future. But then on the other side of the, the equation, you've got Kiev. The city of Kiev is now an occupied post-revolutionary city. The Rada, the parliament, which we anticipate will soon have elections, maybe hopefully not too soon, as Jane cautions, uh, is surrounded by guys in hunting uniforms with ragtag weapons of all kinds who have built makeshift barricades out of tires and bricks. I've shown some of you the photos on my cell phone. We can upload them to the, to the Wilson website. This is a complete mess. And when you talk to these people, which I've had the, the good fortune of doing, um, sometimes, frankly, with a, a little bit of fear for my safety, because these are not friendly guys, by and large. These are folks who have come through five months of living on the street. They are covered in soot. There are no facilities or services. They are usually well armed. Um, some of them really resent that I, that I speak Russian to them, but I don't speak Ukrainian, unfortunately, though I can sort of understand it. Uh, many of them asked for me to produce my American passport to prove that I was not a separatist. Uh, and these people told me one thing consistently without exception. We are not going anywhere. We are not leaving until we see a complete reinvention of the Ukrainian system. And when I asked them about Mr. Poroshenko and the elections and the transitional government, the answer was almost always a scoff. Mm -hmm. We have no faith in these people. Mm -hmm. We have no patience for these people. And so that's the hard place. And I think the challenge in the immediate short term is how can any competent government maintain its legitimacy, maintain its credibility, while at the same time making the compromises necessary to bring together and hold together a society that includes these kinds of forces. That's an extremely, extremely difficult problem. And what do you think the U.S., uh, Europeans, NATO can do to <coughs> encourage, I mean, the Russians deny that they even are involved here. Right. How do you pressure them to try to put this genie back into the bottle? So uh, I've thought a lot about this, and the first thing I want to say is uh, I don't think there are a lot of good choices. Uh, I think if we define success in this part of the world as defeating the Russians, as you know, we've got a vision for it, and we often do this, by the way. We often say literally word for word, I think the president has said this, uh, that the Ukrainian people have to be free to make their own choice, a choice to go with Europe and the West. So in other words, our choice. Um, and, and when we define it in those terms, I think we basically define ourselves into failure because the Russians have got far, far more at stake. <coughs> and they're prepared, even if it is zero sum, which you know I, I buy the president's position, it's not entirely zero sum. They'll pay any price and they'll make any sacrifice to defeat us. And so we can't be in that kind of framework. What we can do is I think a few sets of kind of things that are likely to be marginally beneficial. Uh, in the short term, the biggest risk is uh, unintended, accidental, circumstantial escalation. And that's why the role of the OSCE, with which Ambassador Ischinger talked about at lunch, is so vitally important. Um, if we don't, this is an information war, right? If we don't know what's going on, if we don't have the ability to credibly convey to the international community and to the people on the ground through media sources which they see as less biased, for example, than television coming from Moscow, what's actually going on, we're going to lose the media war and you're going to end up with people who believe falsely 
that they're about to be invaded, their things will be taken, and they're about to be murdered. And those people will be sympathetic to waves of new violence. Um, and then you have, of course, the risk of accidental escalation. So, so observers are vital in the immediate short term. We've got to keep them there and in large numbers. I think in the middle term, you asked about how we, how we pressure the Russians. It's objectively true. Russia's not playing a productive role at this moment. At the other end of the spectrum, can the Russians solve the problem? I mean, if John Kerry's negotiating position when he sits down with Sergei Lavrov is, you're lying, you're the cause of the problems, and you must fix the problems. If you accept those three premises, then we can talk, right? That's not much of a bargaining position. And that's what it's been. Tom's exactly right, right? We're not focusing on the shape of the door and the solution and the off-ramp, whatever. We're focusing on, this is your fault, you're lying, you're being dishonest, fix it. That's not a bargaining position. Uh, what we can do is create a background that is likely to um, be taken a little bit more seriously by Moscow than what we have threatened so far. And here I agree with what Jane has said about sanctions. Um, I'm not ready, by the way, to pull the trigger on imposing sanctions because I think the conditionality we've laid out is way too ambiguous. I don't think they understand exactly what they need to do and what they need to not do. We've said, play a productive role, solve the problem, right? I think we need to be very clear about conditionality and I think we need to be very clear, and I hope the President has been doing this right now in the last 48 hours, that there is a joint American-European approach to energy and financial sanctions that is sustainable, that is actually real, that whether it's LNG from North America, whether it's you know, massive investment in energy efficiency, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, it's not just Ukraine, by the way. Much of the former communist bloc is horrendously energy inefficient. Um, there's a lot that we can do, and in a five to 10 year timetable, especially when you consider the new Russian-Chinese $400 billion gas deal, you can see a total realignment. Let the Russians and the Chinese have an energy relationship that matches their political relationship. Good luck to them, right? And let North America and Europe have an energy relationship that matches our political cooperation. It makes a lot of sense, and it takes a lot of pressure off of these, this awkward dependency we have now with the Russians. And then lastly, and this is very, very long term, because as I said, I think Poroshenko's main job right now is to survive this impossible, you know, it's like the scene in Star Wars where the Death Star trash compactor is just kind of crushing them, right? <laughs> That's where he is right now. But in the longer term, we in the West have leverage over Kiev like we've never had before. The Ukrainian leadership was always able to play us against the Russians, was always able to say to us, give us money, help us out, and overlook all of our failures, because if you don't, we'll just go to the Russians. Well, guess what? They can't go to the Russians anymore. That option has at least for now been foreclosed. Now is the time when we extract from the Ukrainians the first steps towards real, long-term, systemic and institutional reforms, which, by the way, is what the Ukrainian people want. So we force them to do the hard and right things that they've never been willing to do. We sustain that over the long term. I hope and I pray, and those of you who are influential here in Washington, I hope you're listening, that our Congress and our government doesn't lose attention, lose interest in Ukraine six months from now. I'm a little dismayed that's likely to happen. I think those of us <laughs> duly cynical about Washington know that. But that's the long game. Well, I, to follow up on that, maybe Fiona, we can talk about the, what's going on now in Europe. There, there are these um, talks. You have Putin and Poroshenko. Uh, Olan seems to be trying to get the two of them together. There does seem to be kind of a sense in Europe that maybe we're turning the corner. Maybe we don't have to keep up the pressure. Maybe we don't have to have all these sanctions ready. Um, is, is that whole movement losing steam? Well, I think in the case of Europe, there's more of a sinking realization that we can't actually do any of the things that uh, Matt has just laid out. <laughs> Let's be just blunt about it. The idea of a sort of a, you know, American shale gas, like the U.S. cavalry coming over the hill. I've got a few people who know a few things about this in the uh, audience here. Uh, to save the day in Europe is just not going to happen. Uh, the, uh, what's you know, more likely to happen, uh, in fact, over the longer term, is that you know, uh, Europe is going to have to face up to all kinds of ways of increasing its internal efficiency, its distribution networks, a lot of kind of more boring, mundane things, but the kind of things the United States did after the Gulf crisis to try to you know, wean itself away from this uh, reliance uh, on oil. There is not really much of an alternative uh, to Russian gas. Uh, there's a great book that's just come out of the Oxford uh, Energy Institute by Jonathan Stern, the great guru of, uh, of energy on this very topic, showing quite clearly and very bluntly uh, that there's not another big game in town for Europe, in spite of all of the other efforts to diversify. So it's going to take an awful lot of hard work and would include the Germans, for example, having to turn back the decision that they made to have no nuclear power. Mm -hmm. 
or you know a whole um, host of internal deliberations over um, you know basically uh, national grids and you know Europe wide grid all kinds of things that you know will take bureaucrats in Brussels a long time to deal with but they are fixed on that the other issue is also uh, the sanctions everybody agrees that we have to be on the same page about what we're prepared to do and how we're prepared to do it but there's also now the realization that it's not going to deter Putin for precisely what Mao said at the uh, beginning of his remarks that the vital interests of Russia, as Putin describes them, are at stake here. And he doesn't see that ours are. In fact, Putin actually expects, and the people around him, that we'll do exactly what you just suggested in the opening to your question, that we'll just get tired of all of this, or we'll just think that the pressure's down, and we'll hope that, you know, the situation in Ukraine is resolved enough that a deal's just around the corner, and we won't go forward on, you know, the next kind of steps. It certainly had some pain uh, that has been inflicted on Russia, but Putin also thinks that the system in Russia can withstand that because ultimately the major revenues to the Russian economy come from oil and the taxation on oil and then also you know, to some lesser degree from gas and from gas sales. What we're hitting is the diversified part of the economy, which is the weakest part of the economy in banking and finance, and they will find a way of adapting to that too. That's why Putin's called the oligarchs home, they're all in a huddle, and they're basically trying to figure out how they substitute for Master and Visa card, you know, for example, how they do a kind of equivalent of import substitution around sanctions and how they withstand this, because they think that they're circling the wagons, and they also think the time is on their side. And the Europeans have got that. So, you know, what we're trying to do now and I think, you know, that was some of the idea of Hollande, but unfortunately he's in a very weak position domestically, was to create the kind of door uh, that Tom's talking about. Uh, there is a lot of thinking now in Europe about how do you create a frame, how do you create an alternative background, how do you persuade the Russians that, in fact, there is an alternative uh, to this kind of behaviour. So while you deal with Ukraine, there's now, you know, this feeling that you, you can't do anything other than factor Russia in in some way. The Ukrainian economy on its own, uh, the kind of the scale of uh, the, uh, the restructuring is on the scale of East Germany after 1989. People are recognizing that. I'm in a number of conversations with people where they're realizing that even if it's just a fraction of that, that this is a huge heavy lift and that Russia uh, is going to have to be a feature of that because of the interlinkages that have persisted between the economies. So the question is, while we inflict the pain to punish, which is, you know, kind of basically the, the ultimate goal, knowing we're not going to deter, to try to change uh, the calculation, uh, that we, you know, stick to principles because Putin's trying to see how we react. You know, the, one of the questions was about, you know, kind of what do we want Russia to do? Putin wants us to do certain things too. He wants us to be deterred and to step back from all of this and get back to business as usual. So we have to show that that's not going to be the case. Uh, but we really have to create a mechanism and a framework, the kinds of things that uh, Wolfgang Ischinger was looking for in the case of Ukraine, and uh, the dialogues. We need to have also a dialogue within Europe because Russia is basically saying the definition of Europe that we have now with the institutions, the twin institutions of the EU and NATO is not acceptable to Russia. So if we're going to be a player in Europe, we want something else. Now, what that something else is, of course, Putin isn't telling us. He's basically waiting for us to come up with some suggestions that he can either trash and discard or that perhaps, you know, he can you know, push along a bit and see what else we come up with. So that's, uh, that's our dilemma. Now, we've gone all through this and we haven't even mentioned Crimea yet. So, <laughs> Ambassador Bickering, is, this, uh, is there any way to resolve that? Is the international community just going to have to move on and accept that that's a fait accompli and that it won't return to Ukraine anytime soon? I'm not a voice of optimism on Ukraine, uh, Crimea's future outside of Russia. I wish I could tell you that I was, but I think in all honesty, I don't know there's anybody in this room other than those who would like to hold out the hope is continuing to put pressure on the Russians for some reason that it will be the answer. But I think that Many of the things that Matt and Fiona have said are very important. Uh, I do think that this is a real potential point of crisis for Western Europe. Um, I can remember in 1994, I gave the annual lecture at Ditchley, and buried in the speech I was in Russia were three paragraphs warning the Europeans against precisely this type of calamity. I had no idea, in fact, that it would ever come, but I knew that it was unhealthy as hell to be widely dependent on a single source of hydrocarbons uh, for the long-term future of European prosperity and growth. And I can't imagine that anybody doesn't get the message that over-dependence on Russian hydrocarbons breeds a situation in which Mr. Putin will use every tactical stratagem uh, that he can uh, to seek his goals, which I think are basically 
to play a major role in the bilateral, trilateral scene in the world, uh, to increase his opportunity to have a sphere of influence, certainly on the old former Soviet Union, perhaps less the Baltics, which I think he has to consider as a NATO red line. Uh, I think that continued to trumpet Russian nationalism and so on. Uh, my own view is this isn't going to come soon or early, but European energy strategy is a very critical question to the future of Europe in a way that at least brings about a balance, not a dependence, with Russia as a trading partner and indeed uh, as a country in which there ought to be uh, open movements and mutual respect, but not blackmail. Uh, to me, if I were sitting in Beijing, I would look at the same thing. I've wondered. Is the $400 billion deal represent 10% of Chinese energy needs, 50% of Chinese energy needs, 70% of Chinese energy needs? I suspect it's closer to 10 or 20%. I also suspect that the strategy to deal with Russia now is for countries to reduce their dependence to the same ballpark. Uh, in some ways, that means that collectively they have power, uh, but individually Russia doesn't have influence. And that while there is always the question that hangs out there that is bedeviling the Europeans right now is where does the extra energy come from? A question that we are all looking at, I think, very urgently. I'm not sure in the long run that it is a totally impossible task. I think there is U.S. shale export, shale gas export. There is LNG from the Gulf. Uh, there is Libya, which is limping along. Uh, the Libyan problem is not a very juicy one uh, and a very serious one for us now. And how and in wh what way Libya will move to realize its fuller potential. Uh, there is a hope, I think at the moment, a lot more forlorn than I would like, of a, Janu of a July 20th deal with Iran. Uh, but increasingly turning on Iran oil and gas uh, might have a very useful and indeed valuable trading opportunity both in Iranian behavior and indeed in European expectations and one shouldn't lose sight of this. Uh, whether there are other aspects of uh, the African uh, coast <coughs> province moving, uh, whether there are other sources or not, I'm not sure. I, I liked Fiona's thought about nuclear. I understand that uh, Germany won't turn off nuclear for a few years. Uh, and I'm not sure in the long run that safer nuclear is not better than turning off nuclear if we could finally achieve it and close the back end of the fuel cycle, which I think is within reach uh, as, as a useful way to proceed. But this is a huge energy challenge. And in many ways, that's the area that's going to have, I think, the major influence on Russia. Uh, diplomatic isolation has its own role um, and its own possibilities, but it is not endless. And it doesn't, in some ways, once you turn off most of the possibilities there, have any uh, potential for increasing capacity. And it does get in the way of the piece that I think we're all mentioning in one way or another. Uh, is there a door that one can shape uh, out of this particular problem as you increase the pressure? I said earlier, and I believe very much, that we should have found ways to increase the pressure earlier, but I'm not sure I knew precisely what they were. Uh, and to some extent, uh, that's a counsel, a little bit of despair rather than kind of full knowledge. Uh, but had we an, had an opportunity, it's important to do so. I think over time, obviously, the really critical question that we have to think about, is there a position uh, beyond which we would not wish to see the Russians go where it would invoke the NATO uh, red line uh, operating itself in a way that was clear. We have tended to muddy that. We have muddied that in the interest of protecting Ukraine, which is not necessarily a terrible idea for muddying. On the other hand, I'm not sure in Moscow anybody believes uh, that the military balance that was so out of kilter in Crimea uh, remains uh, somewhat closer to kilter, if I could put it this way, uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine at the present time. And whether body armor and night vision goggles are the answer to Ukraine's problems of dealing with its own issues, as Matt has so beautifully laid out, uh, which are internal and civil as much as they are external and separatist, if I could put it that way,
is a very interesting set of challenges. My own view is that in every sense of the word, uh, moving now uh, back to the diplomatic, as forlorn, as difficult as it seems, seems to me so much better an option, even as we increase the pressure, uh, than moving heavily into the military side. Some have suggested, I guess it was Les Gelb months ago, uh, that we put our best fighter plane in Poland. And I can see some advantage that, particularly if the Russians wanted to move large numbers of troops across the border, and it gave you some opportunity to have air supremacy in that situation. But I think that that's, at the moment, a long range and probably not very realistic hope, and one that is likely at this stage only to increase the confrontational, uh, confrontational character of what we've got uh, and not necessarily help us to define a door. I think it's a, an excuse for a door. I think a lot of what we're talking about are excuses for the hard thinking about the door. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, uh, the sense that I get from diplomats is that there, there's not going to be any big movements of weapons into Ukraine. The, the message is that they don't want, uh, the, they want it, the Ukrainian government to continue to show respect. But an interesting thing, Ukraine is part of the Russian military industrial establishment. And big pieces of eastern Ukraine in particular are caught up in manufacturing items that go into the military product, a uh, good share of which ends up in Russia. Uh, now, and to some extent, is that helpful in a way? Is that a pressure point or is that a point of irritation? And can we take advantage of it or is it in fact something that we have to watch out for very, very carefully? I also think that Ukraine has had a long background in the armaments business. It is not a huge powerhouse, um, but one doesn't detect a serious shortage of weapons or ammunition in Ukraine. Maybe the opposite is the case. So what is it that we are supposed to provide and how and in what way could it become a silver bullet for the answer, which is, I think, the constant test of what you do. Can I just add yeah. something on the, um, the military industrial complex? Because yeah. this is one of these wonderfully ambiguous uh, areas here. <laughs> Because uh, Putin actually very recently, I think it was just a week or two weeks ago, she had a big announcement that in fact they were going to stop uh, having orders for the uh, manufacturing <laughs> yeah. of, of weapons from abroad, meaning Ukraine, yeah. uh, and you know a few other places that they used to uh, you know buy from um, in the past, and that they were all go going to basically potentially start up the manufacturing cycles and chains in uh, in Russia. And this is all about jobs as much as yeah. anything, and yeah. in this case, he's taking away Ukrainian jobs which Russia has been um, creating the orders and the demand for, you know, obviously it'll, it'll pu it punishes Ukraine on the one hand, but it also boosts the prospects of Russia, if he actually, you know, does this down the line, of keeping a lot of people in jobs. Putin actually expressed a great concern uh, back in his sort of State of the Nation uh, speech at the end of last year about the jobs in uh, the Russian, uh, uh, basically, industrial sectors, especially in armaments. He said there were 7 million people, not just all the workers, but their dependents, who were reliant on this industry. And Russia would have to make sure that not just did they have jobs, but there was a market for those weapons. So arms um, issues is all part of you know, Putin's sort of thinking, because his biggest fear is that you get what happens in Ukraine. You get an economic collapse. And just like in the 1990s, you get people out on the streets again with economic grievances, wondering you know, where their jobs have gone, where their wages have gone, and why they haven't had their pensions paid. He's averted all of that. So there's a lot of gaming going on here. There's not just about the geopolitics or the military balance, but it's also about jobs and you know, also inflicting more punishment on Ukraine. Because all those people you know, who work in those manufacturing sectors will be scrambling around, and the people who run the factories will be scrambling around figuring out what to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> I have many more questions, but I want to give an opportunity to, as we have so many people in the audience, um, a chance to ask some questions as well. So I guess there are a couple of mics. And um, if you can just uh, tell me where you're from and say your name. Uh, I think right down here in the front, there was one. David, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw it. I could have uh, asked some more, but... <laughs> yeah, why don't you ask another question? <laughs> it's okay, we got it. Hopefully that works. Uh, David Sedney, uh, formerly with the Defense and State Departments. Uh, Fiona, you raised a very interesting point about uh, Putin's uh, ability to mask what he's doing and cloak it in uncertainty. Matt, on the other hand, said it was, he said it was a false fear for people to, think, to be afraid of a Russian invasion. 
So for all of you, is the fear of a Russian invasion a false fear, or is it a, is something that Putin might actually do? Is that something that is in the calculus of possible activities uh, by, the, by the Russians that we should be concerned about? Uh, and uh, I will note that I worked for a former uh, Secretary of Defense who always made the point, you should never cock the gun right. if you're not prepared to pull the trigger. trigger. Yeah. And so is, <laughs> is Putin someone who would cock a gun with, with, without the will to pull the trigger? Let, let me clarify what I think I said. <laughs> I, I did not mean to say that there, it, there should be no fear of a Russian invasion. I believe a Russian invasion has already happened. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the same it, happened, <laughs> it, it happened certainly and unambiguously in Crimea. Uh, and the type of operation that the Russians themselves have accused the United States of mounting throughout the former Soviet space, that is an operation by proxies and through what we would call dishonest, ambiguous means in order to change regimes and change ownership of assets on the ground, is certainly underway in eastern Ukraine right now. So on, by that measure, there has been an invasion and that invasion is ongoing, or at least the occupation phase is ongoing. Uh, what I think is less likely, but I think that our failure, as Tom has said, to engage in diplomacy makes perhaps marginally more likely is a, uh, you know, traditional mechanized, you know, <laughs> military incursion through acknowledged kind of overt military means across the border with a, an aviation component and all those things that NATO forces deployed to the region would be in some nominal sense um, designed to counter, although query whether even if that happened, NATO forces would be deployed to a battle in Ukraine. That, I think, is, is, is rather questionable. I, all, I think all of this goes to the core problem that Tom was getting right at and that Ambassador Ischinger has talked about uh, and that, by the way, Secretary General of the OSC, Zanier, talked about when he was here as well. And that is the fact that we have ceased to communicate clearly about the meaning of security in the European, Eurasian, and Euro-Atlantic space. In other words, it is all happening through this veil of ambiguity about integration projects, right? We almost, we back into overt conflict and ask questions like, is there in fact an invasion or what is the risk of an invasion, rather than having the kind of conversation that I think 70 years ago we would have had, which is, you're invading. That's either acceptable because we think we'll have peace in our time if we just let you do it, or it's unacceptable. But we're not, in fact, having that conversation. And I think the realization that the European and Euro-Atlantic community came to in 1973 to 75 through the Helsinki process that ended in the creation of what's now OSCE is that we have different vocabularies for having that conversation. So we in the West talk about things like human rights and human dignity and you know, how you treat people domestically and that that really ought to be a part of security. And then you know, Mr. Putin thinks about security largely in terms of are you going to accept the borders of the Russian Federation or greater Russia as I see them or the former Soviet Union as it should have been. Um, we can still have a conversation with these people. Uh, it was a mistake, I believe, to have ignored the Medvedev initiative uh, at a new security treaty as ill-formed mm -hmm. and, and contradictory as it was and to sort of blow it off into this non-process named Corfu uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I think what we should have done was looked to the convenient anniversary, 40 years since 1975, coming up in 2015. The Serbs will chair uh, the OSCE, somewhat fitting. Uh, and, and recognize the need for essentially a new Helsinki process, a new process that grapples with all the dimensions of security in the Euro-Atlantic space that has the real conversation with the Russians about borders. They want to have that conversation. Bring it on. We'd love to have that conversation about Crimea, about Georgia, about Moldova, about all the other borders questions, and they'll be prepared to make, to make trade-offs in order to get what they got in 75, which is we recognized post-war Poland and Hungary and, the Czech and, and Czechoslovakia in terms of the borders that they were, we had a persistent objection about the Baltic states. But we basically recognized the borders of Europe in exchange for which the Russians acknowledged and recognized that the issues we cared about, human rights, the international interdependency of the new economy, people's rights to travel and things like that are actually part of security as well. I'm not saying just repeat what we did in 75, right? The world has changed. It is messy, it's complicated, and there are a lot of things at stake. And people, by the way, like the Ukrainians, were not at the table in 75, and they need to be at the table now. But that's the nature of the conversation that needs to be had, David, because otherwise 
your question will be asked over and over and over and over again, and not just in Ukraine. It will be asked in the Caucasus. It will be asked in the Baltic states. It will be asked in northern Kazakhstan. Have the Russians invaded? What are they doing? Was it? You understand my point. They don't want to have a state of perpetual war. I agree with Fiona that they're comfortable with shades of gray in a way that we are not, but they're not fundamentally looking for a Europe that is perpetually at war. Um, I might actually have some more. So you take a disagreement with just that last thing you said, because Putin is using the language of war right now. And let's um, accept it. I, I agree completely with uh, pretty much everything that Matt has said. But Russia did invade a country already in 2008 in Georgia. That was the mechanical, um, you know, mechanized cross-border incursion plus aviation. That was a full-scale, you know, although small-scale in some comparisons, invasion. Russia also invaded a part of its own territory in the 1990s and again in 1999 by invading Chechnya. And every time you, know, you, you talk about the collapse of the Soviet Union, people keep talking about how peaceful it was. It was not peaceful. And anybody sitting in this audience <coughs> who remembers the 1990s and the uh, wars in Moldova and uh, Transnistria, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh, and then in Chechnya, will remember that that was not the case. In fact, we're going back to that phase now in some respects in Ukraine. I don't know about other people here, and I see a lot of people sitting here in the audience who've been following all of this, but I feel like I'm back in the 1990s again when I see what's actually happening in Ukraine. And that's Putin's frame of reference. Putin actually saw, and he says it quite explicitly, if you look at his speeches, that the Russia has been in a struggle ever since the end of the Cold War. We're not in a new Cold War. There's just a, a new war that started that never really ended, which is about Russia's place. And over again, he, he has chosen, and others have chosen, different forms of military intervention. Now they have in their military doctrine, especially since 2012 when he returned to the presidency, uh, and actually an underscored uh, preference as a result of lessons learned from Chechnya, which was actually the largest military action on Russian soil since World War II, and the, frankly the debacle of Georgia, when the Georgians managed to hold the Russians off for a much longer period than obviously people in Moscow uh, would, have, um, would have thought. They have now realized that they actually, um, this plays to their strengths, this covert operation. In Chechnya, the uh, military declared victory, and it turned into an FSB operation. What mm -hmm. we're seeing is Putin putting that same kind of operation into play. He, is, uh, he was the head of the FSB. He was you know, moving into the presidency as the second Chechen war broke out. You see the same kind of hallmarks, hallmarks of uh, a covert operation. And the Russian military now is focused on the pointy end of the sphere, the strategic uh, nuclear uh, arsenal. And now that low point, I don't quite know what to call it, and there's some strange kind of spear carriers in uh, green uniforms with no insignias, because they know they can't win on the conventional um, uh, battlefield, certainly not against NATO, as we've been uh, pointing out. And they do actually fear that NATO would be deployed. In 1999, when NATO moved uh, into uh, Yugoslav, into, against Serbia and into Kosovo, a lot of Russians, Mr. Putin included, who was in the Security Council, decided that NATO could actually do that in Russia. And if you t interview, as you and many others have done, um, all kinds of Russians across the whole political spectrum, they will say that for them, that was the turning point, when they actually thought, that, yes, NATO could be deployed and used against them. And so they don't want to raise the threshold. And they tested it in Georgia. They realized it was a major crisis. It didn't, it didn't work as they had uh, wanted it to, you know, for a variety of different uh, reasons. The military campaign wasn't, wasn't clean. And now we've seen in Crimea the new tactics, which are tactics that Putin has actually made part of doctrine. And he actually is still seeing this now, that he's adapting this warfare. For now, and that's how we have to change it, he does see everything as a battlefield. So he how sees this as an asymmetric, unconventional kind of war that's being fought through uh, sanctions economic instruments and also through, as he, as Matt put it, his, what he sees is the deployment by the United States of NGOs and all kinds of other organizations to subvert uh, activity inside of Russia. So how does NATO respond to something like that? I mean, do we see, I mean, they're talking about sending troops to Poland, but not a lot of the Europeans are going to do that. It's going to be American troops. Well, NATO is only part of the, uh, of the solution here. And I think Matt laid that out, you know, quite clearly. And I'd be interested to see, um, what Tom says about this. Because NATO can only do what NATO does, which is defend the territory of NATO members. What we're talking about is the larger question about how Russia sees its position and how we deal with uh, the countries that are not, uh, not NATO members. And that's where Putin is looking for a dialogue about 
uh, you know, where we take this. And, and I think Matt is absolutely right. This is like the 1970s. It's also like the 1980s when we had the Pershing SS-20 missile crisis, the crisis over, you know, the United States posture with Star Wars, you know, the Reagan uh, period. But frankly, we've had these crises all the way along. We haven't really addressed them. Russia actually did protest quite vehemently expansion of NATO, and now it's doing the same with expansion of the EU. In 2008, and the war in Georgia was all about that. Look, we're in a situation now where Putin has discovered asymmetry. Yeah. He's using little green men. He's using separatists. Um, to some extent, he's got to be disappointed that this wasn't a velvet revolution and that all Russian speakers east of Kiev have not risen and joined the flag of these new pseudo-independent republics. And in many ways, he has got to look at his own economy. Uh, growth way down, foreign direct investment way down, capital flight very large, $60 billion has been estimated, uh, and still going, and growth rates expected, obviously, to continue to plummet without a lot of jiggery-pokery, if I could call it that, on the size of the world international community. And in effect, it is having its, its own reaction. It is one of the two pieces that he's put in place that work strategically against him. The other is over-dependence on Russian hydrocarbons, which we've talked about. Uh, so why are we looking at doing new asymmetric warfare battles, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq in the middle of Ukraine? Uh, why don't we look at the areas where we have some strength that he's overlooked? All of the wonderful things he's done for Russia has been to steal the money and fail to change the economy. And in many ways, this is a huge weakness uh, that we really ought to be taking advantage of, uh, regardless of where this question is going, as much as we possibly can. I'm not sure banking sanctions will have a huge effect, but in many ways they've affected the totality of trade in Iran, and we have a unique way of, in fact, saying to foreign banks who hate us for it, that you either do business with us or you do business with Iran or do business with Russia or do business with us. Uh, to some extent, that has a very alarming influence in, in the longer term future. And it's a place where Mr. Putin seemingly has shucked the advice of Mr. Kudrin and others and seemingly dependent on his own infallible uh, judgments about this and that he'll outlast us on this particular issue. And so we are in a question of outlasting each other on some of these issues. And in many ways, this is not going to be resolved overnight. My own feeling is that he would be very reluctant, and this is a guess, uh, to put organized uh, military formations across the border in Ukraine. And to some extent, we have to keep, put it this way, the ambiguity around our present commitment to do everything we can uh, to deal with that particular issue. Uh, nowhere has NATO come up in the past in a sense that I have to tell you that my own thinking has been that the notion of NATO enlargement to both Georgia and Ukraine uh, was a step that could have been withheld with much greater wisdom than deployed, particularly when it was clear that in Ukraine at that time, and I think even at the present time, you couldn't get a Gallup poll in favor of that particular motion uh, on our part. Uh, but now my own view is, is it trading room? Well, I'd be willing to trade it off for something really substantial for Mr. Putin if it really makes a difference to him. I think it makes sense, and I don't think it necessarily undercuts where we are that we don't have a major effort to incorporate Ukraine immediately into, into NATO. Uh, but it's a very difficult kind of question. I'd have to get, so there have been people around who said, let's just give it away now. Uh, but my own view is that it's something that may be worth something to, to put on the, on, the, on the block to trade. I think finally, there is a very interesting and difficult and previously totally acceptable to Russia idea that Ukraine and others could join the EU. It's only in the new Putin innovation uh, that that's suddenly become a very difficult issue, uh, if not uh, a challenging one. Uh, here, my sense is that it isn't necessarily true, even if the UE EU at one time believed it, that you can't belong to two trading blocks at one time. Uh, and that to some extent, one could look at the advantages, in fact, of Ukraine becoming an economic bridge rather than necessarily uh, a country on the way to nowhere. Uh, and that will be important, and the Russians are dependent in part. Uh, on some of the economic benefits out of their relationship with Ukraine. 
Uh, but I started out by saying economics plays a huge role in this. And I think we all have in one way or another emphasized that. And it seems to me a mistake to continue to ignore economics, particularly when it has some asymmetrical pressure value. Great. Right there in the back. And then, actually, she got, well, why don't both of you ask one question each? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the host of the Voice of America, and I'd like a short answer to your, the question of your um, presentation. Uh, if it's not Cold War, what is it? <laughs> okay, and why don't, we take, why don't we take both of them, because they're right there. Uh, Christy DeLong, uh, returned Peace Corps volunteer from Ukraine. Uh, my question is about the European neighborhood policy and how it was implemented in the 1990s and uh, pushed in the 2000s, and how it encouraged Eastern European countries to accept Western ideals. Um, what, and after the crisis erupted, the EU remained mostly inactive. What is the EU's new role uh, after this? Thank you. Yeah, we had times of troubles, was the title here. <laughs> A new, what's the new Cold War? Yeah, I don't know whether we can come up with a, a pithy um, a pithy <laughs> title for, for this one. I mean, the reason that it isn't a Cold War is that it's not global in its uh, nature and, and ideological. Now, Putin has been pushing forward a conservative agenda, and um, the new slogan might be, you know, populists of the world unite rather than uh, <laughs> proletariat of the world unite, as he reaches out to um, UKIP in the United Kingdom and uh, the National Front in France and, you know, kind of plays with these, you know, kind of ideas of it's almost, you know, everyone has their own road to nationalism you know, kind of playing up on the uh, old uh, idea of uh, one road uh, or different roads to socialism. So this is, this is just, a, you know, playing uh, with ideas that we're seeing on the part of Putin there to justify Russia having some kind of exceptional position that is not Europe and is in opposition uh, to the West. So he, he is, he's very much uh, playing in a regional level in Europe. But of course, there are going to be implications for elsewhere, but not that Russia is going to be engaging, as the Soviet Union did, in a very large global uh, struggle where it's going to be uh, basically having the kinds of linkages on the same sort of scale that it did in the past in the Western Hemisphere and, you know, across Africa and uh, across the Middle East. Putin will try to play with it wherever he can. But he sees this much more as a, as a way of sort of leveraging and uh, enhancing Russia's positional. So it's definitely a regional crisis. I think it's a new time of troubles for Europe. It's a new European crisis. But it's not a Cold War in the dimensions that it was uh, before. But it does get to the question about the um, European neighborhood um, uh, policy as well. And I think there's a lot of soul searching going on right now in the EU. Of course, the uh, elections in Ukraine coincided with the European parliamentary um, election. And the EU has been a work in progress for all of this time. So when the neighborhood policy started out, I don't think anybody envisaged that we would end up where we are today with a massive confrontation between uh, the EU and Russia um, over Eurasian Union and uh, the association agreements, as was triggered off at the Vilnius summit. I don't think that the EU thought that it was acting as a geopolitical actor well, when it started to put this in place. Now, some people within the EU might have thought that. There are a couple of, I think, individuals who are heavily involved in the crafting of uh, the thinking behind the association agreements who actually did see this as revolutionary and path-breaking, precisely because all the engagement of the EU over the period of the 1990s has really succeeded in bringing a whole range of countries and, and uh, closer to Europe and also transformative. The Baltic states are a classic example of how you can really transform countries uh, on a national scale, now admittedly small countries, but that's what made the whole situation for Ukraine so explosive for Russia. You know, getting back to a point you actually said early on, uh, Tom, that Ukraine wasn't really a threat to Russia, a massively transformed Ukraine would be a threat, at least to the way of you know, doing business, business uh, currently. So Russia starts to see the European Union as a revolutionary geopolitical actor. Uh, sometime, you know, in the course of, uh, of the last year, when the um, uh, Eastern Partnership Program gets ratcheted up and we get closer to the uh, Vilnius Summit. And I think a lot of people in the EU are actually asking the very question that you are now, where do we go from here? Uh, because there wasn't a, a realization on a, uh, on a, on a larger level, uh, the level of, say, the Action Service or even in the Commission, that they, this would have this kind of impact. And so I think there's a bit of a pause right now in Europe, which there has to be, because now we're going to have a new commission brought in, a new high representative, 
and there's a reassessment and a lot of discussion going on and I'm sure that Ambassador Ischinger and many others will be playing a, a role in this about figuring out you know where do they go from here because there is now the issue of Georgia and Moldova who will be signing their association agreements very soon in the next couple of weeks June 27th I think it is and we'll probably be visiting this whole issue again maybe we'll all be here for another national conversation on Georgia and Moldova which you know I I hope not but I hope we're going to be able to manage this Matt, you had something. I just wanted to add on, on the European Union. I have thought long and hard about the European Eastern Partnership, which is the new manifestation of this neighborhood policy. Um, I think Europe is a strategic actor. I think we have to see Europe in that context. What it lacks is a strategic vocabulary, a way of talking strategically, a way of um, uh, putting itself forward as what it really is. Um, and I think worst of all, uh, Europe has a terrible sense of timing. And as someone <laughs> much wiser than, than I said, timing is everything. <coughs> I think the, the lesson of EU expansion in the last 20 years has been that when done at the right moment, it is entirely possible to put a promise and a commitment ahead of actual delivery, ahead of actual implementation. But when done at the wrong moment, and when the capacity is clearly not there on the recipient side, or when the politics are in some sense hollow, you know, the, the people as a whole of the country don't actually agree with what the leadership is saying and the leadership is signing, then the timing is clearly all wrong. And I think the problem that the EU Eastern Partnership has had is that it has followed timetables and it's followed procedures that have been inherently just bureaucratic, which is wonderful as a matter of strategy. As a matter of strategy, building institutions and reforming societies so that they can be full members in this, you know, improved European neighborhood, the end of war in Europe, is brilliant. And it worked wonderfully for France and Germany over a period of several decades. But with the wrong timing in Eastern Europe, it has clearly been a part of the problem. We had a question over here. Thank you. Um, George Helashvili from Embassy of Georgia. Um, I would say that most of the efforts of the West these days, of the United States and Europe, is, uh, are concentrated on Russia. It's sanctions, it's negotiations, it's analysis and discourse. This is a bit reminiscent of the period of about 20 years ago, the Russia first policy. So my question is, why so much focus on Russia itself? And why are the smaller other post-Soviet states relatively neglected? Because encouraging of these states to be stronger would, um, uh, and to, to encourage them, encourage, uh, encouraging them to resist Moscow would um, have tied Putin's hands effectively. Also, um, along what Fiona said, most permissive gray zones for Putin are exactly these weaker post-Soviet states. Also. There is another point. In the 90s, it, it, it's a myth that Russia only um, became aggressive only in the 2000s. In the 90s, Russia was not a benign power at all. We Georgians know that. Mm -hmm. There was Abkhazia, there was South Ossetia. There were all these conflicts. And by the way, Moscow acted pretty much along the same lines as Putin acted in, in, the, in the Crimea. It was not a declared war. It was, a motorized, it was not a motorized assault. Um, so in that sense, the real policy, the really effective policy emerged only when in 1994 the United States made more accent, m more focus on, post, on, on smaller post-Soviet states. And that is when the real effective uh, policy um, took, took off. And also to answer, I mean, briefly the title of the t or question in the title of this, probably this is more um, a frozen conflict situation rather than the Cold War. And we are heading there as in the 90s. Thank you. Um, since we're running out of time, I, I saw a couple other hands that I want to take you here, and then there's one back there in the middle. And then uh, Dave Ottaway here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. <coughs> I want to come to this issue of whether or not it is global, what's beginning to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, and whether you I'd think like Putin mm -hmm. links <coughs> the, his policy towards Syria, and towards Iran and towards uh, Ukraine, is there not a global dimension to what's happening, whether, whether you call it a Cold War or something else? Is it not becoming more global? Okay, and then there was one over there in the middle, the, the woman in the middle. 
And then we'll try to wrap up since we don't have that much time left. Hi, um, this is Molly Schwartz from the State Department. And I was wondering, Matt, you had mentioned the risk of unintended accidental escalation and the importance of us having observers on the ground or else we'll lose the media war. There are many people who are arguing that we are already losing the media war. And part of that is because a lot of the Russian media outlets are not um, averse to putting out false information, and that requires a lot less time and research if you're not using the same level of journalistic <laughs> rigor. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering, how do we balance this, you know, trying to put out true information and make sure that we stand as the side of journalistic rigor versus losing the media war because you're not getting the first false scoop? Okay, so you want to start with David on a waste Yeah, question. Um, first on the global piece, we will watch that very carefully. At the moment, the strong insistence of our friends in the State Department that it has had no effect in Iran, uh, that they also say it has had little effect in Syria. I think that Syria, the hope was that there would be a movement toward some kind of coherence in views about whether and how a political settlement could be worked out. That hasn't taken place, so you might take what hasn't happened as an evidence of perhaps it's being global. But, but I think that Fiona is right at the moment. It has not taken on global proportions. It could be maybe a refried portion of Cold War that we're dealing with <laughs> at the present time rather than something else. I think that on neighbors, I think it's very important. I think you'll understand that if we're in a neighborhood and somebody's house is burning down, uh, we're going after the arson first and not the arson's neighbors. Uh, and to some extent, obviously, we have to go after and help the neighbors uh, prevent what I would call new incidents of arson, but, but it's important. I think on false info, obviously, um, over the years, uh, particularly during the Second World War and subsequently during the Cold War, we developed a rather fine-tuned method of trying to deal with false information. Now it's once again smothering the airwaves, particularly on the Russian side. And I think that we have to gear up. We're slow at gearing up, obviously, on this kind of thing. Um, but the ability to continue to make clear what's true and what's false is something that I think over the long run helped us enormously. And we have to work with those news sources that are credible. And we have to work with, obviously, making our own news sources credible, not on the basis just of assertions, but on the basis of being able to attribute facts and reality to the situation. A very hard enterprise. In some ways, Herr Goebbels, for a long time, uh, had, the, ha had, the, ha had the high ground. Uh, and we were able to take it back to him over, oh, from him over a period of years, but it took a long while. Yeah, I think the answer is more NPR, right, Michelle? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> the, the problem is, of course, that we don't have that equivalent uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, and that's really the, the, the difficulty. Um, there's a huge debate that's going on, um, you know, uh, well, it's not so huge, but huge among people like us that, that are here um, about the um, information and the media war, because, of course, Russia does have an outlet here um, in the United States of Russia mm -hmm. today, which purports to, you know, show all different sides of the argument, but is definitely very much targeted being a counterpoint uh, to U.S. position. And, you know, we do have reporting that does try to get all the kinds of the sides of um, the argument, but I can't say that that's happening inside of Russia. So the argument is about the media space here that's going on and how people hear the different sides. But there isn't an argument going on about who is hearing what inside of Russia, and it's not just in Russia. It's also, of course, in all of the Russian-speaking uh, periphery, Central Asia, in Ukraine, um, in the Baltic states, where people are kind of picking up uh, the, the media as well. And I think it's extremely hard to counter that, actually. And it's going to be very difficult to to um, uh, basically get alternative uh, messages through, unless you really do do the kinds of efforts that we did during the Cold War. That might be where the Cold War dimensions, you know, kind of come in. On the issue of global, um, I think there's actually some interesting points that we should bear in mind. I mean, Russia has a very different capacity to play in different regions. And although Russia actually would like to see itself still as in a way, you know, the inheritor of the Soviet Union and of that superpower mantle and being one of the great powers along with Russia, uh, with the United States and China. Putin's always talking about, you know, creating a geopolitical demand for Russia and, you know, emphasizing the ability for, you know, Russia to be in Latin America and Russia to be here, there and everywhere. There are only two other regions <coughs> where Russia um, is really uh, very concerned. And I see, actually, in many respects, the Middle East, Syria and Iran being 
something of an extension of Europe in the way that Russia looks at this, which is why they're being somewhat careful. But one is the Asia-Pacific, where Russia is a fact, but it's not a factor, uh, really, in terms of the security, much as it's trying to be right now, because it's very nervous about the future. There's a recent, you know, kind of uh, reporting on Russia's outreach to North Korea. That's a sign, that really is a sign of desperation. And it's partly there, uh, because um, Russia's also worried that whatever happens in North Korea, it's going to be left out of the mix, because prior to this, it had no leverage whatsoever in North Korea. So Putin's really trying to be, remain part of the game in the Asia-Pacific, and doesn't want to be just stuck with a relationship with China. It's an important um, sense of diversification of security and energy, that's true, but also being just you and China with that great long border and uh, a, a massive demographic discrepancy and economic discrepancy could be problematic down the line. And until the crisis broke out in Crimea, Russia was courting Japan and was actually trying to balance off its relations in Asia and was concerned because of you know, China's own probing of, of Russia's territorial waters as well, not just you know, for Japan. And that brings us into the Arctic because Russia is par excellence the Arctic power. It has more territory within the Arctic than any other, although the Canadians would probably argue about that, but Russia is bigger than Canada, no matter you know, how your perspective is. And Russia is very nervous about the future of the Arctic. The United States has the Arctic Council next year. We might suddenly find you know, a whole different dimension here of difficulties <coughs> of dealing with Russia. And Russia's actually worried about China also penetrating the Arctic, because China is the country that's building uh, the icebreaker fleet. Not the Russians, not the Americans, uh, the Canadians you know, still have something. And I think that's going to be the next frontier. So whether we say that's global or it's hemispheric or you know, whatever, we're certainly going to have other dimensions of this than just in Europe. And I think we should watch that very closely, because you know, this game is a long one, as we're saying. It's going to have lots of, uh, lots of new dimensions. So, yeah, uh, quickly, George, on whether we should have a Russia first policy or a non Russian state's <laughs> first policy. Uh, it may not surprise you to hear from me that that, I think, is a silly question. I think the answer is we have to have a policy on all of the above. If, if we ignore Russia, if we say that this is Venezuela with nuclear weapons and so our relationship can be downgraded, but what we're going to really do is focus on building you know, pro-Western democratic partners like a strong Georgia and a strong Ukraine, what will end up happening is we are captive to this ping pong that the leadership in Kiev and, by the way, the leadership in, in Tbilisi even at other periods in your history has done to us, which is to say, well, Russia's offering this or Russia wants this or protect us from Russia. So Russia becomes a part of the conversation anyway, which is why we need to have a strong and a thoughtful and a strategic policy and vision on Russia, as well as towards these countries. They also obviously can't be ignored. And by the way, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Six months ago, it might have been closer to the case. It was hard to get a briefing on Ukraine. I think going forward, there's going to be a lot more appetite for it. Uh, Mali, is that right? Uh, so on the media, uh, one. You can brainwash some of the people some of the time. <laughs> you can probably brainwash some of the people all the time, but you can't brainwash all the people all the time. So let's not overstate the power of the Russian media. Second, Samantha Power uh, said it, although I actually think it was her French colleague who said it first at the Security Council, and she echoed it, uh, in the age of the internet, you know, lies can only go so far. And that's true, too. We, we need to have confidence in the one thing about humanity, right? So people don't change. We've wanted the same things for thousands of years. But technology changes. And the ability of people to sort of watch live streaming video from the Maidan, know what, what the heck was going on, is, is really new. Um, third, uh, the Ukrainian media is a bigger part of the solution, actually, than what we in the West do. But the role that we play in that needs to continue to be. Remember, Ukraine's a huge country. So training 10 Ukrainian journalists mm -hmm. you know, is not enough, right? Ukraine is a huge country. When was the last time we trained journalists from Ukraine's east you know, over a sustained period? Very important. And then lastly, the, the theme of sustainment. Um, again, I'm, I'm very afraid that we're, it's going to be like it was six months ago, six months from now, and, and I won't be able to get a briefing on Ukraine with you or your colleagues. Um, especially when it comes to information, that's how you build credibility, and that's how you teach people about context. And I think people from the media understand very well that if all along you have been persuaded that Stalin was a good manager, that the United States was <laughs> behind the Arab Spring and the color revolutions, and that the Ukrainian Euromaidan was a fascist coup, then you're more likely to believe when the Russian media reports that the 
fire in Odessa was an intentional arson designed to murder 40 you know, pro-Russian people, that that is in fact true. But if instead, over a longer period of time, you've had context, you've been aware of kind of the reality and the other perspectives that are out there, and you're hearing it from sources that have credibility in your mind, that requires sustainment, then you're going to question even something like that. It just seems on its face absurd. And I say this not because I have some abstract faith in the Russian people or the Ukrainian people. I mean, these are smart, cynical folks who have plenty of reason to doubt what their own media tells them based on history. So, but, but they'll have nothing else if we don't sustain our investment there. And we have a big problem with that. We've gone past our time, and we at NPR usually like to follow the clocks. <laughs> so I apologize to the people we didn't get to, but uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank <laughs> you.